the Capricorn Solar Fire Ritual Processional and Alleluia We gather at a holy time, a time propitious for the invocation of the mighty cosmic Lord who wields initiatory fire, and thus uplifts his starry friends, constellations all, and their planetary suns, each a channel for his Lord, and man as well. Yes, tiny man, who gains his small, inconsequent ascent by bathing in the wide compassion of that two-horned, one-horned being vastly greater than himself, the cosmic goat, the unicorn, who roams a cosmic sphere and who climbs a cosmic mountain, and thus climbing aids all lesser beings eager to ascend there proper mount, however small that mount may seem to his far-seeing cosmic eye. We gather here within the stream of solar fire, streaming from the constellation Capricorn. We stand within the power of the Lord of true achievement. Achievement of the lofty ends for which the kingdom, man, was made. Remote and grave, this testing lord, demanding and austere. Tis he who challenges all humankind to put their metal to the test and climb the lordly mount, whereon the man of flesh becomes a truer man indeed akin to those great angels who, shining from far higher heights than lowly man can now attain, show forth the great achievement to which little man ascending must at length attain as well. Let all cramped and cabined visions of the goal of man now cease. Let all meagerness of estimation now be laid aside, for man is great, and greater must become, when once he places foot upon the peak which stands as guardian of the kingdom of the gods. Let striving man become in fact all that the highest kindest gods would have him be. Let him struggle upward to the point of synthesis, and from that promised destined peak let him see and know the glory of the worlds. Invocation of the First, Third, and Seventh Rays through the unicorn of God pass three potent rays. 
The first, which sounds the word of law, a law which may not be escaped until its guarding mission be brought to final consummation. For law is will. And will is truly mercy of a cosmic kind, protecting well the path of light, which leads with firm security from dismal outer darkness to the heart of cosmic fire. Then as well, Ray the Third, which renders possible and visible the plan of God, for that which must be is interiorly well fixed, though flux of time and space require the movement of an ever-moving hand, arranging this, adapting that. So God's intention may at length express through form, though obdurate and all inert, gross matter would impede. Finally, and at last, the seventh has its perfect part to play, for beauty and perfection must grace the polished face of form, a form which faithfully reflects and perfectly displays the adamantine glory of the firm and fixed design of God. For heaven must descend to earth, not in part, but wholly, so that the master work may be complete. We stand within this triple stream of rays divine, a stream of power and sagacity, and as well of rarest skill, bringing forth perfection. Let us breathe within our aura the fiery red of Ray the First, then with an ohm direct it towards the healing of the earth. Let us breathe within our aura the emerald green of Ray the Third, then with an ohm direct it towards the healing of the earth. Let us breathe within our aura the violet stream of Ray the Seventh, then with an ohm direct it towards the healing of the earth. In concert with the will of God, we see these three in unison pass through the cosmic goat, who is the unicorn of God, and then descending to our planetary home, the Earth. At this our time of monthly invocation, we focus our attention on the cardinal cross of heaven, 
the cross of liberation, whereon the will of spirit can finally express itself in perfect freedom. The man of earth will find this cross remote, for long must he revolve upon the sacred wheel of life, ere e'en the cross's foot may stand revealed. But destiny cries out aloud to every struggling soul, declaring that the bliss of will and being lie ahead. The purpose of it all must stand revealed, illusion giving way to the naked and appalling truth, patent to the eye of God. A truth too blinding to be seen by those within that lesser ring pass not man calls his home. The spirit, yes, the spirit, Spirit calls, electrifying man to do its will, in fulfillment of the cardinal purpose of his life within the plan. Let man then hasten to the mounting of the cardinal cross of heaven. Let him drop apparent good for something greater, and thus pass the needle's eye. Four signs are found upon this cross, this cross of freedom and of the Spirit. But one sign, that of Capricorn, is far more potent at this time. Thus let us focus fiery thought upon the unicorn of God, and on two deities which carry out his will. The oldest of the planetary ancients, Saturn, lord of karma and of form, harsh adversary, yet truest friend of struggling man. And as well the god of love and mind as one, Venus, who in loving wisdom draws the joyless, darkened soul forever towards the realms of radiant beauty, where from heavenly nectar flows, outpouring godly bliss upon man's endlessness of tears. As we focus in our thought, Upon the heights of soul and spirit we may one day hope to reach, let us open to the strengthening of adamantine will, revealing thus the radiant diamond planted firm within the heart of soul. In the brilliance of the spirit shining through that jeweled form, let us see as we have never seen before. See as from the mountain top, see in a flash as sees alone the unicorn of God. All together. In the center of the will of God I stand, naught shall deflect my will from his. I implement that will by love. I turn towards the field of service. I, the triangle divine, work out that will within the square and serve my fellow men. Together and as one, we step within the aura of the Lord of Capricorn, and place ourselves within the power of the Unicorn of God, that cosmic being who initiates the Son of Man into the kingdom of the soul, then 
further still empowers him till realms of spirit are attained. What is the being man? Whence and wherefore has he come to earth? Why and whither does he go? To these eternal questions, surely answers true and lasting can be found. For highest reason guides the whole of man's aeonial quest. Is not man a radiant pilgrim from the loftiest spheres descended? banished into deepest matter only to return in joy unto the highest heights? Is not man a native son of ultimate and boundless space, compelled to wander through his choice this gloomy dualistic world, yet bound for restoration of his lordly pedigree? Is not man great, though he seem small? Is he not high, though he seem low? Surely now the time has come, for potent cycles now decree, when once again man may ascend, attaining to that altitude from which in distant ages he in love and in compassion decided to descend. Therefore, blind delusion be dispelled. Let man be known for what he is in spirit and in truth. Let him know himself as he will be, when, once the master of his form, he stands upon life's mountain peak. Let man know his real destiny, his scope and proper sphere. Let striving man, the hardy goat, attain the mountain of his dreams, for man is made for the mountain. What is man? Must he live his life ever restless seeking unfulfilled? What is man? Is he doomed to strive with dissatisfaction? deep, let us contemplate our destiny. Are we creatures merely of the depths and plains, or are we destined for the heights? Where do we choose to live and breathe, and why? If we care not to ascend, then nothing need be done. But if to climb we purpose, with intent to stay upon the heights in spirit and in soul, e'en though we labor in the depths, there is more than much to do. 
Where then do we really stand? And whereon would we stand? Let us ponder deeply. Let us take our positions upon the fourfold field of expression. Though now we may decide whether or no to make the climb, it was not always so. Early man had no such choice. A man of rock and stone was he chained in darkened consciousness to hard, inhospitable earth. Survival, stark survival, was his dominating end, his eyes alert for danger or attentive to his pressing need. He had no notion of a higher way. Downward was he focused, for how else could he live? Downward and in Maya shrouded, compelled by hunger, thirst, and pain, though beckoned by the dimmest sense of something better ever out of sight. Who was he in those early days of Capricorn? Who else but the earthbound soul? I am 
the earth comes home. Fastened, chained, confined, imprisoned, my life is spent in durance vile. A captive I deprived of vision, craving freedom all the while. Nothing more, nothing more, my weary eyes see nothing more. Nothing more, nothing more, nothing more than man. Aspiration for the Heights burns bright within our hearts and minds. Earth-boundedness, a stage long past, and yet chains still exist. The psyche, though ascending, is not yet free and full of light. Let us ponder bondage and the winged freedom we would have. What are the fetters holding us to earthiness, subtle though they be? Let us comprehend their nature, that we may be released for greater service to the plan of God. Let us take our places upon the fourfold field of expression.
The fettered human spirit will not tolerate suppression. Suffer though it may, it cannot be for long subdued. Rise it will, e'en though at first through basest selfishness and strife. Capricorn is friend to Mars, the lord of fight, the lord of might, the lord of harsh aggression. Tamas must be overthrown, violently overthrown, for true achievement to begin. Focusing the sense of self, ambition heats desire and drives the man to have his way, to break or to be broken on the ever-turning wheel of life. A change has come, submission gone. Ambition rules the day. No more the weight of clay, no more the style of pressure. In all I'll have my way, I'm forced by oppression. Let ambition rule, let ambition rule, let ambition rule, let the door stand wide. No more the lash of fate, no more the slave of matter. For no one will I wait, my enemies are scattered. Let ambition rule, let ambition rule. Ambition rule, let the door stand wide. No more the bowing head, no more the servile glance. I'll grasp the power instead. I'll then now prize me my stance. No more, never again. No more, never again. Never again the victim, never again the slave, never again the subject, never again this earthly grave. Meditation. Ambition is a sign of living fire, though misdirected through unknowing to the exaltation of the wretched little self. Ambition has its place if understood and rendered subject to the welfare of the greater group. Yet it remains an obstacle if ignorantly we forget the meaning of the law of love. Let us consider well our lives. Though we say we love our brother, as in fact we often do, do we harbor hidden motives, striving for ourselves alone? Let us examine our desires, their focus and their urgency and what we would condone to have them fully satisfied. Are we ambitious for ourselves alone, or for the greater good? Let us ponder. What man wants, that will he have. 
desire is a creative force, the more so when well fortified by will. Achievement cannot be denied to him who sets his heart and mind upon it. The man of form, however, is not wise. Rarely seeking in those early days what soul would seek. For him achievement is of matter, and he conquers but the realms of form. He forces from the threefold world compliance, ever failing to fulfill the soul, though gratifying to the full, peremptory desire. He prostitutes his power to temptation, three times failing where the Christ did well succeed. A lord of sorts he does become, a seeming ruler, though in fact a slave. Slave to what? Slave to three. The world, the flesh, and the devil. <laughs>
meditation. In meditation deep, let us ponder on these three, for which a man oft sells his soul, anticipating greatness and not a certain grief. Have we preserved integrity or bargained soul for form? Let us see and know the truth, nor overlook a single shameful compromise. Transactions of this craven kind remain concealed without the will to see. Let us apply such will, and thus redeem the soul from subjugation to the lunar realm. Let us see how we may triumph o'er the deadly three, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Darkness nurtures ignorance, the term of which may long endure if light revealing is withheld. But light in essence is of spirit, and the spirit must prevail. The three domains at length are seen for what they really are. Shabbiness, not greatness, stands forth to the unveiled eye. The man, once mighty and invincible in his proper estimation, sees the blatant paltriness of the kingdoms which he ruled, the so-called mountaintop on which he stood, when revealed shows forth the merest hill. Perspective undermines illusion. Great from small is understood. The revelation proves a shock, but a shock much needed, for it infires ambition of a higher, better kind. Ambition turns to aspiration as man prepares a truer and more arduous climb. His mind, now freed from egoistic pettiness, contemplates the great ascent, leading to the kingdom of the soul. I have seen, I have seen what I wish I had never seen, what I never thought to have seen. My mountain is small, my mountain is small. Now I know, now I know what I wish I had never known, what I never sought to have known. My mountain is small. There looms above me something greater, a lofty mountain of vast expanse. Must I acknowledge a creator and throw aside my prideful stance? For my mountain is small. My mountain is small. I must climb, I must climb to a height far above my own, to the lofty peak alone. I must strive, I must strive to the summit of my life, even though I must lose that life. For my mountain is small, my mountain is small.
Meditation In meditation deep, let us ponder great from small. Do we understand co-measurement? Do we value most the highest? Or do we fail to mobilize our energies for rigors of a higher kind? Is aspiration keen enough, strong enough, to bring success in this most strenuous of quests? Let us ponder carefully. Fiery aspiration there must be. Even planetary lords and those beyond aspire to reach a distant goal. But aspiration will not bring achievement if the law of life be not fulfilled. To yearn with fire is good and needed, yet permission must be granted to ascend the sacred mount. The lords of karma govern all within the worlds of form, and a mountain load of karma may impede advancing steps. Let him who would advance assess the karmic tasks to be fulfilled. For first the mount of karma must be scaled, before initiation be assayed. The sacred mountain calls to every valiant noble soul, but first the test of duty must be passed. Let karma, then, be understood. Let the would-be victor perform whatever tasks there be demanded by those solemn lords. For wisdom and the law decree, first the lesser mountain, then the greater. If you would climb the sacred mount, the ancient law you must fulfill. If you would drink from the living fount, you must restrain your selfish will. Must speak the words of karma. If you would venture to the heights, first you must fathom well the deep. Beneath our days that lurk our nights, where sins forgotten lie asleep. Fill your karma if you would prove your merit 
Meditation In meditation deep, let us ponder well our karmic task. Ambition one day turns to aspiration, but aspiration must fulfill all duties ere it wing its way to heaven. Let us survey the pattern of our karma, the things undone which must be done, if we would ever clear our way for our ascent unto the higher mountain peak. Though the law of karma in completeness be obscure to mortal mind, inscrutable its weavings, inextricable its myriad threads, let us seize upon at least one pattern of significance to free ourselves and clarify our path. What pattern do we see? What may we do to balance our accounts? Let us ponder. Let us form the sacred symbol of the Lord of Retribution, highest planetary agent of the Syrian Karmic Lords. The law of karma is severe, though mercifully just. It is wielded from above from brilliant Sirius and beyond. Within our solar system, Saturn is its major agent. Saturn, oldest and in one respect, the greatest of the planetary gods. Though Saturn seem a foe, he is a friend indeed. He holds us to account ensuring we fulfill the law and thus proceed in merit. Duty done leads surely to the soul, and Saturn is the lord of duty. Work performed with excellence will guarantee the manifesting of the plan of God, and Saturn is the lord of work. Justice in all dealings with our friends and foes alike upholds the fragile social frame, ensuring triumph of the good, and Saturn is the Lord of Justice. Responsible is he, more so than we know, for bringing struggling man the long way home. Let us now invoke this potent Lord austere, seeking his exacting blessings on all humankind. Oh, 
Meditation. In meditation deep, let us welcome Saturn to the inner sanctum of our lives. Let us thank him for his rigor, for insisting 
that we think and do the right. Let us determine where his potent ray may be applied, and then welcome application. For Saturn points the way into the hierarchy of life. He speeds us through adversity into the bosom of the Lord. Let us realize his blessings and see the many ways that he has helped us live the life divine. Let us form the sacred symbol of the lighted Lord of Love, Venus, Goddess of the Heavens. The harsh and certain way of Saturn points the way to greater light, the light upon the mountain. The beauty of that living light attracts the weary mountaineer who halfway up the mountain may not sense the strength to further climb. But Venus proves so lovely in her irresistibility that weary limbs are soon revived and the heart sings out anew. Tis said that love will conquer all, even stark adversity, and this is surely true. Let us call upon the Lord of Light Sublime, the Lord who fills with rarest beauty all the light of mind. Let us call upon the Lord who waits to greet us at the mountain top the Lord of all redeeming love. What light upon earth do I see? What subtle beauty warms my heart? Can this the Lord of Venus be?
Meditation In meditation deep, let our hearts unfold in gratitude to the beauteous Lord of Love. Let us ponder well and truly, how may our lives be beautified? How shall we be at last refined? How shall the soul as quality bring radiance to form? Attentively have stood the solar angels lo these many years. How may we let them live through us, pouring their Venusian love through every fiber of our being? Let us ponder. Let us form the sacred symbol of the heavenly star which flashes forth at every entrance to the kingdom of the soul. And when we stand upon that mountain top, apparently alone, in the clear cold light of God, what shall we see? What shall we know? In whose presence shall we stand? In that silence of all silences that unifies the many into one, what shall transpire? Will not all things swiftly change? when we stand before the Lord of Lords and see his star shine forth? We shall be transfigured and become that which we truly are. 
In one blazing moment, as the flaming diamond flashes forth, we shall be confirmed as souls, truly human beings at last, the animal defeated and uplifted both. At this time, yes, even now, let us in imagination take our stand before the Lord of Life, and together, in solemnity, sense the august presence pervading all our earthly worlds. We take our stand, we take our stand, alone upon the mountain top, alone within the holy presence, the presence of the Lord of the world. of the Holy Youth, the Ancient of Days, awaiting the flash of the flaming diamond, and the shining forth of his star. Star shine. 
In meditation deep, let us stand within the presence. Let synthesis be real to us, blotting out all form. Upon the pinnacle of consciousness, let all cleavages be bridged. The fragmentation of illusion, gone forever, gone for good. As we seek to understand the excellence we might achieve, were we to live within that presence, ever onward from this point in time. Let isolated unity and godly presence now be known. Let us form the symbol of our holy union in reflection of the union of the Lord's. Who are they who stand united, radiant in supernal light? Who are they who joyous Share the bonds of God's eternal love. Who are they who form a guardian wall protecting all the sons of man? Who are they indeed? Are they not priests within an order higher than all priestly orders of the earth? Are they not priests? whose hyparxis is the Lord of life himself? Are they not priests in the service of the highest center of all centers? Priests of the order of Melchizedek. Kingdom of 
meditation. Would we be as they are? If so, how shall we prepare? Could we stand the pressure thus related to the Lord of life? Could we bear the burden which all liberated souls assume? Let us ponder the condition of the holy ones who form this potent group. For we stand as yet within the outer circle of their power. What service and obedience must we render? Would we move still closer to the center of their life and ours? Would we be members of this sacred priesthood? Can we prove our aspiration through the sacrifice of all? Let us ponder well in meditation deep. The conqueror of the sacred mountain, standing in supernal light, still stands between two worlds. Below lies the distress of earth, ever veiled in lightless gloom. Above, progressive realms of splendor towards which the path of life ascends. Once he knows the beauteous truth of unity divine, how can the lighted soul descend? And yet, how can he not? For living in the unity leaves selfishness behind, demanding for the least of men the lighted freedom he himself has now achieved. Yes, greater glories of unending heights and depths of space appear. And yet he may not venture after lofty spiritual delights till cries below be stilled and tears of men be dried. Resolutely, in denial of his higher aspiration, he, the unicorn of God, turns his back upon the bliss which he might have freely had and goes instead unto a darkened place which bears no friendship to the heavenly light he bears. Like Moses, he descends into thanklessness and sharp rebuff. But his love is greater than the spite which greets his reapproach, for he has seen what one day all the sons of men will surely see, and thus he patiently absorbs their censure and the sting of their rebuke. For in the near and distant future they will stand where now he stands, like himself, refusing to be lost in light supernal, so that others may be witness to that glorious light of lights. Lost am I in my supernal? Lost am I in my supernal? 
Meditation In meditation deep, let us dwell within the highest light we may conceive. What does that holy light reveal? Does it awaken our compassion? Are we truly bearers of that light? Have we turned our back upon the light to better aid our brothers on the path? Let us ponder our relation to the light which shines in glory on the mountain top of life. Let us form the symbol of the conquered peak, from which down streams the inspiration to be shared with those below. With decision and descent behind, the bearer of the light goes forth to salvage and uplift. With spirit and with strength, he strives to waken all he meets unto their destiny divine. He shocks inertia till it stirs, directs desire till it releases hold of lesser things. Instilling a new rhythm, he charges men, approach the soul, be witness to the mountain, which at length or even now you may ascend. He, the conqueror of death, would raise to life the living dead, that they, as he, might pass the gate which leads unto eternal life. From dust unto the starry heights, he bids his brothers rise. Meditation. In meditation deep, let each conceive a mountain blue, the mount of triumph of the Spirit's victory. And seeing this in clarity within the inner eye, let us pose these questions to ourselves. 
Know we how to share achievement, if we have achieved? At home, within the holy fire, can we inspire our brothers so their fire burns more fiercely? If we have climbed successfully, what can we or what will we do to help our earth-bound brothers climb? Do we care? What can we, will we do to help them climb the sacred mount? Let us ponder. And so the soul of fire assists, assists those who, though far below, would strive unto the heights. To stir the sleeping souls of men is joy to him, though his reward is oft the bitter currency of pain and harsh rebuff. A son of God is he, though human still, and in his sometime humanness may backward think upon that day of glory when the sacred summit was revealed to his astounded, opened eye. Did I truly see as now I think I saw? He may well ask. Did I stand alone? Why did I return, leaving truest joy behind? But sad nostalgia for that higher state is held at bay, and he feels again the sweet and piercing oneness of the heart. E'en in his darkest moments he knows why then he chose descent. That certain knowledge holds him to his task, a comfort in all times of woe. He knows that none may seek salvation for himself alone. He knows beyond all refutation, sons of God, initiate, never stand alone. When I stood alone before the Lord of the world, did I truly stand alone? The
blessing of the one who stands in pride. Wide, wide is the door for the one who dwells in eternal life. For he sees all the world from a point of steel. For he sees all brothers as himself, for he sees all souls flowering together in the heavenly field. And all spirits as one spirit stood before the Lord of the world, did I really stand alone? No, no, no. I never stood alone. For Meditation. In meditation deep, let us ponder that aloneness which is joined to God and man in love. Let us realize that though we seem to tread the arduous path in growing isolation, that isolation is the mark of nearness to the heart of God. He who seems to stand alone upon the icy peak is intimate unto God's love, warm within the solar rays, though outer form be frozen fast. Let us ponder paradox, the strange equation which demands stark isolation as the heavy price of union. But that price is not beside the endless bliss revealed.
And thus the cycle runs its course. The low becomes the high. The lower goat of ill repute transforms into the unicorn of God. Why one horn instead of two? Why white and not a darkened hue? How triumphant over death? How stronger than the blinded king of beasts? What mystery is close concealed within that beauteous mythic form? The mystery of life and death. The mystery known only to the one who stands in triumph on the mountain. Sing praise to the unicorn of God, the conqueror of death, enfired by the power of the flaming rod, breather of the fiery breath, the white and holy unicorn, triumphant holy. Meditation. In meditation deep, let us focus on the unicorn of God, standing in monadic might. Let us sense his triumph. Let us take our stand within the synthesis of spirit. Let us know the two as one. Then comprehend the one withdrawn within the ever potent point. Who is this noble beast we must become? Why does he rule the sacred mountain peak? Who is this valiant unicorn of God? Let us ponder and Identify.
the initiate stands free, untrammeled, unafraid, wise in heart and mind, courageously detached from form, obedient to the Lord of life, that ageless youth who with his rod confers the gift eternal, the gift of conscious immortality. Let all praise Melchizedek, Lord of the Flaming Mountain. Then, as wisdom adds to wisdom, we may well and truly say, Lost am I in light supernal, yet on that light I turn my back. Together. Lost am I in light supernal, yet on that light I turn my back. Let us return to the circle of invocation. If anyone has aught to say for the welfare of the group and of the world, this is the time to speak. Let us sing the invocation of the new and dawning age.
Allah.